Welcome to the Whole Athlete Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you become a fat burner, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hey, it's Debbie. I'm the host of the Whole Triathlete Podcast, and today my guest is Dr. Kendra Becker, who is an integrative physician practicing for over 10 years. She specializes in the four A's, which are asthma, autism, allergies, and atopy. She is going to talk today, though, on mitochondrial dysfunction and how we can improve the aging process as we continue training and racing in our endurance sports. We will also dive into how to train and not damage ourselves at a cellular level, as well as how to eat which foods are going to help us in the recovery and repair process. So she joins the similar passion as myself in trying to teach you how to heal your body from the inside out, beginning your journey of healing, resiliency, and starting with your cells. She likes to work on nutrition over, over supplementing and how you can learn how food can be your medicine or your poison and that your genes do not define you, but certainly can, can help guide the way of your healing. So let's have Kendra on the show today, and let me know if you have questions. You can head to debbiepotts.net and put any questions in there, as well as social media, Facebook. We have got the, uh, the Whole Triathlete Facebook group page. You can find me on Instagram, The Holistic Athlete. Also on Pinterest, I try to save Pinterest items that are great contributing to the holistic method eight elements. So let's go into today's show talking about those mighty mitochondrials. All right, talk to you soon. And if you like what you hear, please give us a review and hopefully five stars on iTunes so we can help grow the podcast. Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Hey everybody, it's Debbie Potts, the host of the Whole Triathlete Podcast, and today I have Dr. Kendra on the show today, who I've followed her blog, and she's all over social media, helping share the mission of helping others get healthier from the inside out. So Dr. Kendra, so thankful for your time today coming on my show. I'm honored, Debbie. Thank you so much. Well, tell us a little bit about, I showed your intro or explained your intro beforehand, but what is your mission? I like to ask everyone, what's your passion and your purpose and how you're creating impact? Sure. So really, I mean, my my passion is to honestly, tell people the truth about their health and I truly believe as humans like everything that we have as far as healing our own bodies is is within us we just need a little bit of gentle guidance or maybe gentle pressure depending on the person to achieve those goals and so really that's kind of what I focus on in my practice I, I find that my method for the most part is relatively simple you know I like to remove the obstacles to, to cure you know whatever it is that's causing the imbalance in the body and really help people cultivate and create the best being that they can be. And that's really about it. You know, yeah. No, which is a lot, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. And that's what, you know, we are all out there writing these blogs and webinars and podcasting is that we're trying to help those people. Cause there's so much information that is not out there really that, you know, to help people. And I just listen people of all ages and levels that just struggle to get healthy and then go doctor after doctor and, you know, listen to my parents and their friends are all late seventies, early eighties now. And it's just so frustrating because you can, we can help people so much with just little adjustments in nutrition digestion, or today we're going to talk about mitochondrial health and that we're Absolutely. all built on cells. So talking for the endurance athlete, we're always talking about ways to improve performance, but also I'm finding as I get older, I want to help people improve the aging process because endurance exercise is a lot of stress on your body. I just came back from Ironman Hawaii seeing these crazy, amazing fit elite athletes and professionals, you know, people around the world just 
kill themselves when by grunt. And then it's like, oh my gosh, is this really good for us? But we love to do it. Well, it's it's so funny. And everything is always so timely. It's it's just it's funny how things work out. Um, as you know, I work out fairly regularly. Regularly, I ran a half marathon, you know, I was a competitive runner for a while. And then, you know, I don't know, I felt like I needed to do something else. So I started weightlifting. And I've been under a tremendous amount of stress in the last three weeks has every workout that I've had has been oh, painful. And I mean, it's not like I've upped my weights or upped my reps or changed anything about what I was doing, but it was it has been painful. So I dialed way back from everything that I was doing. And I am doing a six week, basically, what I would refer to as like a spinal rehab program. I'm working exclusively on core muscles and um, my erector spinae muscles. And it's, it's such a tremendous departure from where I usually sit as far as exercise goes. And I think that's, you know, kind of a message that you have too, is that you just have to listen to your body and that we're, you know, those of us that are endurance athletes that really strive for peak performance do need to sometimes take time to do these, you know, really gentle balanced exercises in order to increase performance at a later date. Yeah, I think what, you know, is my story in my book, I wrote Life is Not a Race, is that we're, you know, people are doing this endurance exercise, creating what's called now is chronic cardio, doing the success of cardio training for endurance events. Cause you do have to put in the time and, you know, you're sacrificing sleep or, you know, adding extra stress to your body because you're trying to fit so much in, in one day that I think it's, you know, how to manage. Yes. I'm training for a race, training for a triathlon, endurance race, 50 K, whatever it is. But, you know, how can we do this without imp- increasing risk of injury and other areas of uh, cellular level stress. Right. So talk about, let's kind of, let's go over the basics of what do the mitochondrial do and why is it such a big topic in the nutrition and endurance health coaching world right now? Right. Absolutely. So a, fo- a big focus on what I do in my practice is I look at genetics and I look at unique individual, um, you know, genetic assays for, you know, people and sometimes families. And so what I've done in my practice is I actually run a fitness assay. And so by looking Looking at the specific genetics that an individual presents with, we have the ability to be able to support or modulate those genes, figure out if they're expressing themselves, and help that particular athlete or individual be able to maximize their performance. So, for example, right, um, there's a gene that's called GSTM1. And interestingly enough, if that gene is expressing itself, it decreases the body's ability to fight free radicals. And we know that free radicals are anything that cause oxidizing damage to our cells, anything that causes us to age. And so, you know, those of us in the very cool over 40 club, we look at Mm -hmm. aging as, as, you know, decreasing of of the body's ability to do things. But the truth of the matter is, is from the moment you're conceived, you age, and we want those cells to be in peak peak top, you know, performance ability for 100% of your life. And so, you know, a gene like that is something that we could absolutely support in holistic medicine to be able to help somebody who's expressing that to be able to, you know, help neutralize free radicals in a more, um, you know, an optimal way. There are several genes, interestingly enough, for uh, injury risk and, you know, lengthening or or extending periods of time for recovery. And so I think really the message in my practice is is really looking at these individuals um, with their own set of, you know, genes and circumstances and being able to come up with a plan that is most specific to their body and their ability, their exercise or, or performance ability. And so, you know, and mitochondria, of course, plays into that because mitochondria is all of our what we call our ancestral DNA. And ancestral DNA, you know, gives us, you know, a lot of the genetic predispositions for for a lot of the genes that we can now test for, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, there's a lot of different talk, even 23andMe and ancestral health and this local club here, Pro Club, is starting to do their weight loss program with genetic testing. So genetic testing seems to be a big area that keeps growing and being available to more and more people in the market. So, Mm -hmm. you know, how do you know if you need 
if your mitochondria aren't functioning at optimal level, what are some signs and symptoms that, all right, maybe it's my mitochondrial that need a little resetting, need a little cellular detox or some support to get them functioning better? Right. So, of course, every Everybody is different. In my practice, what, you know, I would basically do a comprehensive um, exam and an intake on those patients. And if I hear things like, um, I feel like I'm aging faster than uh, my peers of the same age, and I don't do anything that would cause, you know, oxidative stress on my body. Or, you know, what I hear a lot with athletes is, um, I've had three knee injuries in the right knee, or I, I have this trick hip. You know what I mean? There's always something that lets me know that the body is out of balance in one way or another. And clearly it can be more than just mitochondria, of course, but those are the things that would tip me off to want to be able to support somebody. Being under a lot of stress can physiologically stress your mitochondria. You know, living in an environment with a lot of pollution, whether you live with a smoker or you are a smoker, or you live on a street where a busy street where there's lots of pollution from cars. So there's lots of different things that can that can lead me down that path when speaking with somebody. But everybody really does come in with their own unique set of circumstances. And I find as I said before, stress is a big area for everyone that I meet in my fitness studio every day. And everyone is kind of feel that anxiety that need to like rush to the next appointment. And we're just busy. Even if you don't have a full-time job and a family, people are just busy and our busyness of looking at a cell phone multiple times a day and all that. So how does stress impact our cell health and the mitochondrial health so stress can as you know has a huge impact and it it can impact a whole host of metabolic pathways so as we know all healing and all disease begins in the gut right and that's because the bulk of our immune system is developed in the gut the bulk of our neurotransmitters are manufactured in the gut so if you have high levels of of stress hormones um adrenaline we'll use for example as you raise uh, adrenaline or as you even raise cortisol, in, in the case of cortisol, you actually raise blood sugar. So when you raise blood sugar, then that creates a leaky gut. So then when you have a leaky gut, you have higher levels of inflammation and it's just this big, you know, cascade of events that can happen. And so if you are, you know, upregulating a gene, for example, there's one that's called COL1A1 that um, actually prones an individual to ligament injuries. So in that case, the weak area in that particular body would be ligamentous injuries and that patient might like likely have more ligament injuries than somebody who'd be doing the equivalent, you know, program and have none. And so, you know, it's definitely something to be really mindful of. And, you know, for me, I, I am definitely, you know, a whole person kind of doctor where I definitely like to look at the, the person as a whole. But if we're talking about stress specifically, there are supplements or even, you know, dietary modifications that we can make for patients to be able to help mitigate, you know, what we, you know, experience as stress. And now as humans, we don't have the luxury of living a 100% stress-free life. And I don't know that any human would really want that um, because, I mean, there is benefits to stress. I mean, it can, it can help increase focus. It can help even increase muscle mass in some cases. Um, it certainly can help us get things done quicker, but it's the low grade or high grade for in some people, chronic stress that we experience over months and years that actually can cause damage and accelerate aging. And again, when we're talking about aging, it's not, we're not talking about wrinkles and and vanity aging. We're talking about physiologic aging of our cells. Yeah. And I think that's a big area. It's like the cells, it's, it's what I would say in working from the inside out, but at a cellular level, because we need to remember that we're built on (laughs) thousands of cells. And if they're not optimal, working at optimal levels, we're going to have some sort of dysfunction and random symptoms as we're talking about. But how can we improve that aging process of the cell? Like we were just talking about already, Mm -hmm. but just, I think the biggest thing is people are going to keep pushing themselves. They might try to adjust and, you know, have a little bit more reset, rebuild, recalibration sessions during the week. And, 
and they keep training for another race. Mm -hmm. You know, people get done one race and especially, you know, watching Ironman Hawaii, and mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm already in good shape. And this is what I did before I had my downfall and spiral in 2013 is that, all right, I just did Ironman Canada. Then I was doing Ironman Hawaii. And then, well, I might as well do this December Malibu marathon. And, oh, February, there's 50K race. Well, I already have that endurance. I'm going to do that. So then we just keep going. We don't ever <laughs> take a season off. And, you know, you just think, oh, what's another race? It's easy for me to do a marathon after you've done Ironman. And so anyways, people just don't, Type A personality is typical for triathlete, endurance athlete, and we're just already doing too much. So how can we continue racing, maybe not a, you know, take more breaks, obviously, but without damaging ourselves? Because people aren't necessarily going to change, maybe cut down the racing amount, mm -hmm. but they still train and race a couple times a year. Right. So, so the American Academy of Sports Medicine states that anybody that does a physical, you know, a truly physical sport, and you can go look at on their list as to what they consider physical, you know, it's football, basketball, cross country racing, you know, the whole nine yards should take a full season off every 12 months. So that's like three months off off. So that's, that's their recommendation. That's not my recommendation, but it makes perfect sense as far as, you know, you know what we're talking about to kind of rejuvenate and balance our mitochondrial health. I know that that's not the reality, especially, especially, you know, I, like I'm over 40. And so I know when I'm, when I don't run for three or four weeks, I feel in some cases, like I start back at square one. Yeah. So I think it's a matter of, you know, being really mindful for your body. We've all had to recover from injuries and, and we know that it can be done to take a season off or several weeks off to, in order to help our bodies heal. And so I think, like you said, you know, it's not, it's not a race to the finish. It's, it's more of, you know, you just want to be better than you were yesterday. And so I think that's part of it. But there are a gazillion things, you know, we can do to support, you know, mitochondrial health in our diet. You know, a plant, you know I prefer and recommend in many cases a paleo type diet. It's a nutrient dense diet diet. Um, it's high in, in beneficial fat, it's high in protein, you know, you get most of your macros for my distance runners and my triathletes and, and, you know, anybody that's really doing, you know, at more than 60 minutes per day of endurance running or endurance, whatever, it doesn't have to be running at basketball players and things like that. Um, I do recommend that you add a complex carbohydrate in there, you know, generally either right before your exercise, your uh, workout or after, depending on what you're trying to do to balance macros. But there's a gazillion things you can do as far as supplements, particularly based on how your genes are expressing. So, I mean, you know, the standard, what we strive for in every single solitary cell is more glutathione, right? Glutathione yeah. is a, the best antioxidant that our bodies, you know, manufacture. And that helps protect the cell membrane from any kind of oxidative damage, like we were talking about from pollution, stress, exogenous, you know, stresses and things like that. So, you know, anything that we can do for our bodies to help produce more glutathione is great. You know, producing, glut you know, growth hormone when we sleep helps our bodies make glutathione. Taking a supplement like, you know, lipolyzed glutathione or a precursor like N-acetylcysteine helps the body produce glutathione glutathione. You know, you eating and utilizing, you know, beneficial fats help the body helps the body produce glutathione, keeping your liver in optimal function helps the body produce glutathione. So anything that we can do as humans to maximize that gives us a benefit for, you know, anti aging, if, if nothing else. So that's a good way of looking at that we want to increase glutathione, but I think so many people start taking so many supplements mm -hmm. that yes, you have to reboot the system, get the body to create its own, find its own homeostasis and we should do this stuff on its own. But you know, is it good to take supplements for this all the time? Or is it, I mean, in nutritional therapy, we want the, you know, do it for two, three months or so until you find your body's at its optimal level, but it, you know, more you read an article, you get this supplement, you read something else and they say this and you know, how much is too much? Right. Well, I, you know, I'll be completely honest with you. I am not a huge fan of a gazillion supplements. Okay. I just, I don't think it does what nature has intended it to do. I'm, I'm, I'm really a food is medicine girl and I would much yeah. rather people just include glutathione rich foods in their diet. 
And, you know, it's easy enough to do. I mean, it's, it's strawberries, it's avocados, it's acorn squash, you know, turmeric helps the body make glutathione, garlic does, asparagus, okra, you know, walnuts, for goodness sakes, um, milk thistle, which is supportive to the liver are all things that are, you know, foods that are rich in glutathione. And, you know, as long as we are helping the body, like you said, reach homeostasis and be the best organism that it can be, it doesn't have to mean, and it shouldn't mean handfuls and handfuls of supplements. Why well, I, I talk a lot of lately about digestion, and even if we're eating all this good real food, I think people need to be able to make sure we're, are we digesting our food properly and absorbing the nutrients? Cause as you said, you know, serotonin and dopamine, the neurotransmitters and everything goes on in our digestive system and we make things in our gut. And you know, I was just writing an article about how hormones, where they come from. People forget that, you know, they can take all these supplements or eat all these foods, but are you properly chewing your food and sitting in a relaxed frame of mind and eating slowly enough to have that whole digestive process occur to absorb and break down those nutrients. So I find it great to hear that, you know, not taking all these gazillion of supplements because so many people do. And I know I do some, you know, nutritional therapy, we test supplements on people and I just like find the bare minimum they need and just to get the body to, you know, a lot of people need stomach acid, for example. And, berberine or something that helps the ends pancreatic enzymes and help that digestion system but so many people aren't able to get the nutrients from their foods oh and that, that's absolutely true which is you know like i had said earlier all disease and all healing begins in the gut you've got to got to fix your gut for sure um and exogenous stresses can certainly be a huge factor in how our bodies digest and assimilate foods. Our genetic predisposition can be a huge factor in how our bodies digest and, and uh, assimilate foods. So if you have, you know, a genetic marker that's, that's upregulating called COMT, that helps the body kind of degrade and eliminate used up neurotransmitters. However, you know, one of the quote side effects of that particular gene expressing itself is estrogen dominance. So we know if we have somebody who has estrogen dominance, whether they're a male or a female, that that's going to prone that individual to a leaky gut. When we have a leaky gut, we then have an immune system that's fired up, compounding with, like you said, low hydrochloric acid, which is, you know, a huge issue with exogenous stress, antibiotics, pharmaceutical medications, um, low bile acids, or, you know, no gallbladder. I mean, there there is a whole host of things that can impair digestion. And it's definitely worthwhile to, you know, take a very long time to evaluate your clients on, on their digestion and assimilation. And those are, the, you know, those are kind of simple and easy, you know, life hacks that people can, you know, almost do on their own. You know, people that have low hydrochloric acid, they can drink a little bit of uh, water with lemon before every meal. Um, you know, you can take something like a supplement like biotin, which is really assimilatable, but it's a cofactor in how the body makes and manufactures hydrochloric acid. And then you don't have to, you know, be so strictly monitored or chased around on your dosages for hydrochloric you know, for BT and HCL, which can sometimes, if a patient has, you know, another condition that hasn't been identified, can be damaging to the gut. So, you know, there are definitely, you know, quote, life hacks for that, all of which, you know, definitely do what we needed to do as far as supporting our, our cellular health and, you know, aiding our digestion to be the most optimal that it can be. And it's a process. You know what I mean? You may have periods in your life where, you know, things are going very, very well for you from a digestive standpoint. And then something happens and you almost have to kind of rebalance yourself. And that may look differently than the last time you had rebalanced yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing we keep saying is that everyone's by individual and not one size fits all it was actually the quote I put on my Instagram image today was that, you know, there isn't one program for all and everyone's individuals. So you're, you keep talking about the gene testing. Uh, what do you suggest people do to do genetic testing and find out what's going on with themselves as well as any labs you suggest your clients do? So, um, you know, you can, do any number of the companies that are out there you know i i've been in practice 12 years the genetic testing 
Uh, when I first started for what we have now was about $1,500 per person. And now, I mean, you can get a 23andMe or an Ancestry.com, you know, full genome for like $49 to $89. Um, I use a company out of the Pacific Northwest called Toolbox Genomics because I have my own unique um, genetic profile that I test on my patients. Um, and I think whatever, you know, whoever you're using as a provider will likely have some expertise in one area or another. And so to use something that they're comfortable with would be probably my best answer. Um, as far as lab testing, I think it all depends. For me, I generally start with the genetics. I would want to see the genetics of my patients first before I start, you know, chasing them around with labs. You know, if they have an MTHFR gene or um, a CRP gene, I'm going to want to look at inflammation. Or if they have, you know, immune modulators like IL-6 or IL-4, things like that, I'm going to want to look at different things in their immune system on blood work. So the problem with blood work, as you know, is that we are limited to the technology that we have. And so a lot of the results that we're looking at are serum results, which, you know, specifically when you're talking about mitochondrial and cellular health, don't really mean a whole lot because really what we want to know is what we, what's really going on inside the cell. So, you know, some of that testing is, you know, A, not available to us or, to, or B, very expensive. And so we use what we have. But I really think a full comprehensive exam and a dialogue with your patient will lead you in many cases down the road to help them with their recovery. Great. Now, so a lot of us are aging, as I said, we're getting over 40. Some of us getting to their late 40s. <laughs> and we want to race or, you know, train to do some event next year. What are some tricks that you have or how can we, you know, work in a cellular level? How can we actually get faster? You know, how do we do things still get stronger. I know I was just watching Iron Man. I have friends that are 50 something and she's still Diana Hassel still kicking butt in the world championship every year. My friend, other friends now 60 and still killing it. And then there's this oldest guy in Iron Man Hawaii this year, 86 years old. And it's just amazing to watch awesome. these people, you know, towards the end of the night, especially you see people of all ages and sizes, finishing and some of them running sideways and bent over, but it's mm -hmm. like, how can we improve our performance and get faster as we get older? Is it possible? Um, I, I, I would actually defer to you. I'll take care of the cells. <laughs> you take care of the muscle mass. But I would say, I mean, I think number one, you have to be kind to your body, whatever that looks like. Number two, I would definitely support either through diet or through supplements glutathione and glutathione stores. The other thing that I would do is I would work very, you know, closely on methylation. Methylation is the foundation for how our bodies detox toxins, you know, toxins like lactic acid, like arachidonic acid, like, you know, chemicals from our environment. So if methylation isn't working properly, our detox pathways aren't going to be working properly. And those are the sorts of things that I would focus on, or I do focus on with my elite athletes. And, um, you know, to be able to help them with cellular recovery to reduce and minimize cellular aging. And then they can go see their, you know, top notch trainer to figure out how to, you know, push the levels of their endurance. Um, and I think too, I mean, genetic definitely plays a part in that, you know, to look at some of the genes around, you know, like VO2 max and, and your aerobic potential, you know, I have everything in my practice. I have patients with very low aerobic potential and very high aerobic potential. So, you know, the higher your aerobic potential, you know, just by the God given, you know, the genes God gave you, you know, may be a, a predisposition to what you're able, you know, able to be capable of as you age. But I, I mean, I also think too, as you know, more than anybody else is that it's mindset. You know what I mean? And, and if it's something you want to do and you put your mind to it and, and you're doing the right things to train and nourish your body, I think anything's possible. Yes, very true. It is mindset. It, you know, I just love the information you're sharing with the athletes because why I keep wanting to go more nutritional therapy side for this podcast more than, you know, how's your swim, bike, run workout is recovery right. repair, but a cellular level and, as you're just speaking of, which the glutathione and other foods to boost that up, but the liver detoxification pathways. And there's so much more to really improve your performance than just what you're doing for your workout session that day. It's what we're doing the rest of the time because we are stressing our body 
but how do you recover, repair, and you know, not damage our cells? And I don't, we don't want to speed up the aging process. We want to slow it down, or at least, you know, I say improve the aging process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I definitely think, you know, antioxidants, you know, I think it's, it's something that is really underutilized and under discussed, you know, and and you can find antioxidants in, in a number of places, you know, like a cup of blueberries. But I think that, you know, just being mindful of including those sorts of things in the body. You know, when we have antioxidants, you know, we know that we're uh, mitigating the amount of oxidative stress our bodies are, are being exposed to. But we're also facilitating repair of things like collagen and tendons and elasticity of our, even our cells at a cellular level. So those are all things that are super, super important. Um, I know that your elite athlete crowd probably doesn't, but that when I hit the very cool over 40 club, I stopped running every day. I started running every other day. Yes. And, you know, for me, it was just, it got hard on my body and my low back and my hips. And I was like, there's, there's no way. And so, you know, now it's easier for me to cross train. I just don't, you know, I don't run Ironman. So I'm not, I'm not even going to comment on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know what the training regimen looks like, but I think, you know, diversifying training and diversifying diet and supplements can certainly help with accelerated recovery and you know reducing injury risk yeah definitely mixing it up and running you know every other day instead of every day or back-to-back days and I'm doing more 30 to 45 minute workouts now not doing the over you know hour and a half workout is is so much more and it's such a mind shift for endurance athletes to go okay 45 minutes that's not even worth my time putting my shoes on (laughs) Mm-hmm. And that get so much out of it. I did 30, 45 minutes last week in Hawaii when I was there every day. And that's like, okay, I got so much out of a 30 minute workout that I didn't kill myself and actually increase my cortisol levels and increase the stress in my body by doing an hour plus. Mm-hmm. So next I question you. was, yep. you know, you talk about more paleo. Uh, what's your kind of, uh, for athletes, you know, when you're coaching them, do you have, everyone's kind of hot on keto right now, low carb, high fat, paleo could be, you know, all sorts of, it's eating real food. So what's, what do you find that you're, when you're coaching people or as an individual, what type of ratios, your fat, carbs, protein, eating real food, we all agree on, but do you have any areas? Um, So I, so I definitely start in the land of paleo. Um, I have deep concerns with long-term term uh, I with long being on the keto diet long term um, and I haven't found it to be abundantly successful for for female athlete, athletes so I stay away I generally stay away from it I will use it you know short term duration for uh, people who you know like women with PCOS or men with a lot of central adiposity but as far as athletes none of my athletes in my practice have done well on the ketogenic diet is that a hormonal um, level or what, what are some I symptoms? I think it's hormonal. Work? I think the macros aren't quite right. I think they have um, leg cramps and, and complain about a lot of uh, restless leg. And, you know, for some women, it's, it's just really difficult from an emotional standpoint. Like it kind of jacks with their hormones as far as menstrual cycles and things like that. That. So I don't. I only use it almost like a dietary prescription for like a short period of time. Mm-hmm. So I generally... I really am in the land of paleo, except for, you know, like I said, my distance runners, you know, anybody that's, you know, training for a half or a full marathon, I always suggest that they go to something like a, a 40, 30, 30, 40% protein, 30% fat, 30% carbs um, during their, their endurance r- running period. So, and that just seemed to be, you know, to have worked for me. I have a couple of, interestingly enough, I have a couple of aerial artists who are Mm -hmm. patients of mine who were on a strict paleo diet. They did really well for a while. They uh, increased the amount of performing they were doing. And then they added quite a bit of carbohydrates in their diet, like almost 40%. And that seemed to be a better ratio for them with just the level of fitness that they were utilizing their bodies for. Yeah, as you said, and we all say, it depends. <laughs> it depends on everything. Yeah. So, 
But, you know, as far as a maintenance diet for, you know, not the elite athlete for, you know, the average athlete that's working out, you know, five days a week, 30 to 45 minutes a day, I think a paleo diet is perfectly fine. Like you said, it's nutrient dense, um, it's whole foods diet, it's, you know, you're shopping the perimeter in your grocery store, you know, those sorts of things. And so I think it, it tends to be a good place to start for most people. Yeah. And then one more question is, are you into intermittent fasting at all? What's your thoughts on that? Or even full day, like a broth fast or? Um, I do a lot of intermittent fasting myself. Um, I, you know, I just think it works for me. I started uh, when I, I changed around my work schedule and I was seeing patients from like nine to two straight through and I never took a lunch <laughs> and I w- would end up at two o'clock and I'd go home and just eat everything in the house. I'd be like, I, can't, I just can't, you know? And so then I started intermittent fasting with lemon water or tea or broth or, you know, things like that. And it just made a, for me a world of difference in how I was feeling, you know, at two o'clock, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to go for a run now instead of go home and like eat everything. Thing that there is that is a, has a crunch. So um, I have had some success with it. Um, I'm in a constant battle with my trainer about fasted cardio because I work out at five in the morning yeah. and she is adamant about, you know, you're not burning fat if you're fasting with cardio and blah, blah, really? blah. And I've been working out at 5 a.m. since I was in my 20s and there's no yeah. way way that I'm going to power down, you know, 20 grams of protein before I walk out the door. I can't do it. So I don't. And again, I hate to, you know, I hate to sound like a broken record, but it is kind of, it's, it is very individualized. Yes. Very true. Well, let's kind of wrap up. I know it was so much to talk about with you. I love your kind of on the same page and love all your knowledge and information to share. So where can people find you and get more information about your services and blog and all of your wonderful things you're working on? Awesome. So my website is drkendrabecker.com. Uh, my blog is attached uh, to that page. My, uh, I also do see patients, you know, in a, in a physical office. I'm in uh, Connecticut and that website is Family Wellness Center of Connecticut, the initials fwcct.com. And I, I also do do Skype or uh, Zoom calls for patients as well all over the country. And, uh, my second book just came out. It's called, called All You Can Eat, which kind of talks about a lot of the stuff that we had talked about where, you know, food is your medicine and be your own doctor. And um, let's see, the next speaking engagement I'm at, I think where I am physically somewhere, I think is in May at Autism One in Chicago. So I just came back from Denver and I'll take in a few months off for the holidays. Good. Well, great. And you have lots of information out there and follow you on social media. So thanks so much for sharing our journey here and helping with getting athletes faster and improving the aging process and being just healthy from the inside out. Absolutely. Thank you for all you do, Debbie. I think your message is incredible. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm on a mission as well. So hopefully we can help (laughs) together. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the Whole Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at wholeathletepodcast.com. You can help us continue and grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and see you next time.